like me that we've had so far a regular gastronomical jubilee with this fine breakfast we had. Usually it's a piece of cold uh, bun and some uh, jelly around it. I was at Phoenix the other day and they give me pancakes with no, we call them down south, flapjacks, and they didn't have any lasses with them, so I, I, I had to put sugar on mine. It was, it was just a... And I hear we had a real time. And I, not only that, but that in the natural, we're having one in the spiritual. Yes, so glad to hear this little brother's testimony. I was called in the morning to his bedside. They told me something had happened. I think he is one of the first ones to try to sponsor this meeting. Certainly it was Satan tried to do that to that man of God. But you see how God does? He turns it right around to an outstanding testimony Amen. to show his power. He'll make everything work together for good to them at loving. So thankful to hear that testimony, brethren. And it's really been a privilege for me to be in this city with you people. It's, uh, oh, I just can't express it, how I feel about it. Now, we haven't had overflowing crowds and things as sometimes we do, but it seems like that God is fixing to do something or it's settling something, just getting people ready for something, getting the people back on the line where they should be. And to meet these fine pastors and so forth. And then my privilege of coming here this morning to speak for the full gospel businessman. Uh, I understand that the chapter here is still in its infancy. It's very small, and as the brother here said, that they needed man. Well, as many of great fine organizations as, as re I have represented around the world, of all the full gospel, many of the Baptists, and different ones, why, I still belong to one group, and that is the, the businessman, because it doesn't represent any certain organization. In itself, it's, it's inter-evangelical. It just simply doesn't represent nothing but just the full gospel. And so we're happy for that. And I think that you man here of the city, it's really, if you believe me to tell you something, it's truth. Uh, this is a time where the full gospel businessman can get together for fellowship. You learn things from each other. And such a time on a Saturday morning to speak. The president, uh, the international president, Brother Shakarian, I uh, was made acquainted with him many years ago. Many of you know about uh, uh, the telegrams laying on the desk so high and picking through there. I found a woman named Shakarian dying with cancer. And uh, somehow the Lord led me over, and that's where I got acquainted with Shakarians when she was healed. That's where Dr. Theodore Palvitas was baptized out there when him being their doctor, a Greek doctor. He said, the very idea of you building people under a false conception, said, that woman laying there dying. First, when I went in the house, he said, now, when you go in, said, be reverent, quiet. Said, because the woman's dying, she's been up here and both breasts have been removed and she's swollen up, said, she's got to die. And said, uh, there's nothing you can do about it. And I just listened to his lecture for a while. He said, now, uh, be real quiet. Don't pray loud or anything. He said, say your little prayer and come back down. I said, yes, sir. So I went on. I know I wasn't going to listen to that, you know. And I, said, we, I went on upstairs. And there was, I believe I, I got it back now. I went upstairs. And Florence then, a young, beautiful young lady. And Rose and all of them out praying. And her mother laying there unconscious, been unconscious for a couple of days, all swollen up. And so knelt down to pray. And when I did, there come the angel of the Lord came down to the bed, said, in three days, she'll be up. So I just turned and started out. And they followed me. I said, in, it's in the name of the Lord, she'll get up. And so they started screaming. Here come uh, Dr. Palvitas and was going to run me out of the house. And he just, I said, um, he said, the very idea. And I said, well, building those people under the false hope. The woman's dying. I said, according to all your statistics, it is. But according to the word of the Lord, no. Amen. I said, she's going to live. Nonsense. He said, uh, you should leave this place. Get out of here. And Brother Shakarin stepped up and said, wait just a minute. <laughs> he said, we had you down here also to, for our doctor, and we appreciate you. He said, but we also call Brother Branham. Your hopes you give us none. He does, see. And I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. If she isn't up and out again within three days, I'll put a sign on my back, false prophet. And we go right here in Los Angeles, and you get in your car, go down the street, blowing the horn, pointing to me. See? 
And then if she is up, let me put a sign on your back, quack doctor. And get in your car. <laughs> he wouldn't do it. <laughs> Later on, he was baptized in the irrigation ditch. And was uh, <laughs> serving the Lord. Since then, he's been taken home to glory. And so I got acquainted with the Sicarians. Later, I was part of helping them organize their first chapter. And across the nation, around the world, I've helped them in their chapters. They're a very fine group of men. I think that you're, you're missing something by not having your fellowship strengthened here. Uh, because it is fellowship. We should assemble ourselves together. The Bible tells us that as we see the end approaching. Not forsaking to assembling ourselves together. It'll, it'll not only do that, it'll strengthen you. And you, your strength will strengthen the church. And it's all... The uh, full gospel businessman is not an organization to set aside and say, this is our group. It's for all believers to come together. And it, it's just a unit of the church. See, the church itself, the, the spiritual believers. And um, I think it, it's a great thing if you if you would do it. Uh, it's kind of a little, maybe it don't, I hope it don't sound sacrilegious, but someone said to me not long ago at a meeting, he said, a uh, man said, say, you're a preacher. I said, well, I kind of halfway guess it's all right. I, I'm kind of afraid if I say about preachers around full gospel people. You know, my, my father was a, a, a rider. He'd break horses. When I was a little boy, I thought, you know, I was going to be a rider too. You know how little boys want to be like their dad. I was going to be a rider also. So... I'd get Dad out the back of the place, you know, when plowing, and I'd take my old plow horse out and take him down to the old watering trough, you know, shoot out of a log. How many ever seen that? An old, well, what part of Kentucky are you from? <laughs> so, how many have slept on a straw tick? I just might as well take off my coat, my tie. I'm really at home here. <laughs> that's 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 my environment. <laughs> so. I used to go down there, and Dad had a saddle, you know, and so I'd see him way back to back the place, and I'd get the old plow horse, get all my brothers, and set them around on the fence, you know, and I was the oldest of nine. Go get me a big handful of cockle burrs and put it up on the saddle, pull up the cinch, climb up on him. <laughs> my poor old fellow so tired, he couldn't even raise his feet off. Of him. <laughs> he just bawled and carried on cockle burrs, sticking him, you know, and pulling that cinch down on him. So I'd take off my hat, and I was just a, I was really a cowboy. <laughs> I'd read too many magazines and so on. So I let my brothers believe that I was a real cowboy, you see. So I thought I was. To, when I got about 18, I <clears throat> slipped off from home, went out to Arizona. They needed me to break their horses. I'm sure of that. They, just, they needed me. So I must leave home <laughs> underage, but I slipped off. And I happened to get to Phoenix just in time of a rodeo, you know. So I went back out there to look their stock over, see which one I was going to ride. And once the rest of them couldn't ride, I was going to ride it. You know, I had the silver saddle. I was a little bitty fella, always been very small. And I thought I'd get me a pair of shafts. I know my father wore them, and he didn't have any at the time. And so I got me, a, seen a pretty pair. You know, I had the A-R-I-Z-O-N-A -A at the bottom, steer heads and things on. I thought, oh, my, that's going to look good on me. You know, I kid. I pulled them up on me. It's about 18 inches of it laying out on the floor. And then, I looked like one of these little bandy chickens, you know, them feathers. Them. I thought, that'll never work. So I just went and got me a pair of Levi's, and I thought, I'll make some money. So I went out, looked all up and down that stock stand there so wild that they wouldn't even eat hay in it in the manger. I thought, oh, my. So the first time they brought out, it happened to be strange. Uh, saying this this morning, never thought of it just now. But the first horse was to be rolled that afternoon in competition was called the Kansas Outlaw. And he was from Kansas. Great big 17-hand <laughs> outlaw he was. And um, so this famous rider there was supposed to ride him. So I got myself uh, up on the corral fence like the rest of the riders, you know, and set up there, pushed his hat back. I thought I looked like a real rider looking up. So this fellow come out all decorated up. He, he, when he come out of the chute on this horse... <laughs> He made about two or three twists in the sunfish, and the, the boy, the, the horse went one way and the man another. The pickups got the horse, and the ambulance got the rider. Blood running out of his ears, and the horse going on down through there, and the pickups got him. 
The scholar came by and said, I'll give any man a hundred dollars that'll stay on him uh, ten seconds. He walked on down the air, coming out the air, said, looked right straight at me, said, are you a rider? And I said, no, sir. <laughs> I changed my mind right quick. I was no rider. When I first was ordained in Missionary Baptist Church, I packed my Bible under the arm, you know, like that, and I got my my credentials. I, I was a defender of the faith. That's all there was to it. I was thought I was a preacher. One day I was in, over here at St. Louis when this little darty girl was healed, and I thought that I was a minister. I went out and I met the Pentecostals. And this Robert Darty, some of you may know him, and I heard him preaching. And that man preached till he would buckle in the knees and get blue in the face and go plumb down to the floor and come back up catching his breath. You hear him two blocks away, still preaching. <laughs> I'm always so bad this way, you just don't think of it that fast. Anybody said to me since then, are you a preacher? I said, no, sir. <laughs> I kind of have to watch that. Paul said to me, up at Philadelphia, there's where the next meeting is to be held with the international. I'm to speak the 29th, open the meeting the 29th with Dr. Brown and, and many of those brethren along. That's at Philadelphia. It begins the 29th of this month. It's my privilege to open the meeting. So, and have a couple breakfasts for them. Uh, some fellow said, Why are you hanging around that bunch of businessmen? You're supposed to be a preacher. And I said, Well, I, I am a businessman. He said, uh, well, uh, what, uh, what business are you in? I said, the uh, assurance business. <laughs> I said fast so he wouldn't catch it, you see. He didn't get what I said. I said, insurance. I said, assurance. <laughs> he said, uh, well, uh, I'm, uh, I'm glad uh, to know that. He said, uh, what, uh, where's the headquarters of this company? <laughs> said, what kind of insurance is it? I said, the eternal life. <laughs> he said, I never heard of it. Where's the headquarters? I said, glory. <laughs> so if any of you fellows are interested, I'd like to talk the policy over to you after service is over. I remember some time ago to own insurance. I hope there's not an insurance man here. My brother's an insurance salesman, by the way, the Prudential. So I was thought I got a little dull deal on an insurance one time and uh, they didn't read the policy to us just right. And Dad worked for 10 years for a 20-year paid out endowment, we thought. When it was ready to be cashed in, it was worth $7.50. And we thought it was worth hundreds of dollars. But, And I, I don't know. It's all right. Insurance is okay now. I'm not downing that. That's perfectly all right. So I had an insurance friend, or sold insurance, rather, a fellow I went to school with. His brother writes in the upper room. He's a very fine Baptist minister. And so Wilmer came up to talk to me one day. He said, Billy, i come to talk to you about some insurance. I said, well, Wilmer, I said, I tell you, we've always been good friends. I said, um, uh, and everything. I said, if you want to talk about the weather or, or about something else, all right. But by going fishing or something, I'm willing to talk about that. But uh, he said, well, I said, you really need some insurance. And I said, I have uh, assurance. And he said, oh, God, then I guess... Jesse, that's my brother's already sold you policy. I said, no. I, and my wife looked at me like I was a hypocrite, see, because she knew I had no insurance. So uh, she looked at me, and I said, yeah. I said, I have insurance. Mm. said, uh, what is it? And I said, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. I'm an heir of salvation, purchased of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. He said, Billy, that's very good, but that won't put you up here in the graveyard. I said, it'll get me out. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not worried about getting in. I'm worried about getting out. So. Amen. Businessman, I'm still in the business. If you want to talk some of this over with me, I'll be glad to do it with you. But it's a great thing to have fellowship. I believe it was written in the Scripture... Uh, how sweet and pleasant it is that brethren can dwell together in unity. It's like the anointing oil that was on bear, Aaron's beard that run down to the hems of his garment, skirts. It's something about a fellowship. God alone, in the beginning, he was only God. He wasn't even God at the beginning. Did you know that? He couldn't. God's an object of worship, the English word. See? 
as a, he was Elohim, the self-existing one. He wasn't even God, but in him was attributes, such as your thought. See, your thought, I have to see something, and then uh, I think of it, and then speaking, and a word is a thought expressed. So in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was expressed, see, brought forth. And now all is the same, same as we are, born again. we got eternal life. If we had eternal life, there's only one form of eternal life. That's God. And we are attributes of Him. I can talk amongst Christians this way. We are attributes. And Jesus came as a Redeemer. How many believe that? Amen. Redeem. It's not create something new. Redeem is to bring back that which has already been. So what are you scared about? <laughs> it's, all, it's all in His hands. The clock's not ticking wrong. Everything has to be this way. It brings us to this spot. Now, and I trust and certainly hope that each of you men here this morning that's not a member of this fine fellowship, that you'll talk it over here with this fine man. I just got to shake his hand. Uh, the president of this chapter, and strengthen yourself. David said he strengthened himself against the enemy. And you, man, you, you, you want to do everything you can to strengthen yourself against the enemy. We are here as full gospel brothers. See, we believe it. Let's get to work and get out and get some of these other brothers and bring them in, whether they're full gospel or not, and bring them into our, our meetings and pray and do our part to strengthen the body of Christ and, and that we strengthen ourselves. God be with you, help you. Anytime I can be a favor to you, let me know. Now, let us, before we approach the Word, I don't want to keep you here too long. I'm, I'm just, a, as I said a while ago, I'm kind of slow, you know, and uh, I have to kind of think of it slow, and, and my mind's not too good to begin with, so I, I just have to kind of take my time and don't know no more and just what He tells me to say it and gets me in trouble sometimes, get me out of it other times, so I, just to say what He says. But before we approach the Word, Let's approach the author. Some time ago, I was riding along with a famous doctor of divinity. Many of you might know him, William Booth Cliburn. And he preaches the gospel in seven languages. And we were talking about God and his attributes. And I was speaking of it. I said, it's like a diamond, God is. See? And I said, then these gifts that you speak of, I said, they're, they're just reflections of God's love. And um, I said, like in Africa, we... I, uh, the president of the mine at Kimberley was one of my ushers in the line. He'd taken me through the diamond mines in, uh, in Kimberley. Well, you can find them laying on the street, but you dare them to keep one. Unless it's cut, it has to be cut with a pool. So then, a great big diamond, it doesn't have the fire in it when you find it. No, it's got to be cut for that. And that was God. And he had to be wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. He's the big diamond. And then when you cut a diamond, did you ever notice you cut it in a three-cornered shape and the sun against that will reflect seven colors? See? And looking red through red looks white. Did you know that? That's right. Red through red. That's the blood. The red blood, looking at a God looking at a red center through red blood turns him white. He's in the white. You see? And, um, and so now uh, in that I said God chip cut bruise to reflect in these rays as it hits the the great word of god reflects what god is and this mr cliburn said but you just don't know your bible i said that might be true but i know the author real well so that's a, that's the main thing if i know the author to know him whether you know all the word or not just to know him I believe it was Hudson Taylor said to the young uh, missionary one time, he said, Mr. Taylor, I've just received the Holy Spirit. He said, shall I go get my Bachelor of Art? He said, don't try to shine the light when the candle's half burned down. Let it shine while she's a-burning. Right. In other words, if you don't know what to say, go tell how it was lit. <laughs> That's good enough. And you full gospel businessmen do the same. You don't, don't have to wait and be a minister. Just testify what he's already done to you. That's what you come together here for. Is testify what He has done for you. That'll shine light to others to be lit off of that. That's how the lamps in the tabernacle was lit, one from the other. Not a strange light, new lighting, but the same light. I mean, it's the same God all the way through that shines the light. Let us speak to this great author now as we bow our heads. Heavenly Father, 
to come together now in heavenly places, this we realize is not a church building. No doubt but what the, the Kiwanis and the many different orders, the lines and, uh, and everything meets in here. But this morning it is a church because the, the kingdom delegates has assembled together. And we feel already from these testimonies and hymns, uh, we are, are conscious of the presence of the great king. We know that he's here. And now, as we as children, and offering to thee the praises of our lips, all, maybe not orderly, Lord, but just it's children, you understand it. No matter how much we try to use our our manners and intellect, uh, it might not come from our heart. It's something artificially putting on. But when we from our heart offer you the adorations that's in there for you, I'm sure it'll be received. Now, we pray that you'll just uh, uh, bind us around the card of the Holy Spirit, gather our hearts together, and speak to us through uh, uh, the Word of God. Bless this little chapter, Lord. Give it strength. Ah, the Lord have planted it out of water day and night, lest some should pluck it from my hand. I pray, Lord, as your servant, bless them. Strengthen them, Lord, for the kingdom's sake. Bless every church that's represented in you this morning and every person. And if there be some here this morning that, that's really not saved, I, I pray, God, that this will be the hour that they will find out that they're insufficient to meet death, that they will receive the, the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, thy Son. For we ask it in his name. Amen. Now, in the meetings, I think I've preached to you so hard and everything in the meetings. I don't want to take uh, preach a sermon, and I think it's not really... Uh, right to have a, a gathering without reading the Word and talking just a little bit on the Word. So here's, I have selected from the Word here just a, a little drama, a little story. Some of you, I've given it two or three times. But I think it would bear again. You could bear with me just a little bit with this. I'm going to, to read from the book of St. Luke. Um in the 19th chapter, beginning with the first verse, it's a very uh, strange little text. Think of a place like this uh, to have it, but yet all the words inspired, fitting in its place. And I trust that God will take this word and fit it right in where it belongs this morning. Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who, wa who he was. Let me read that again because I want to emphasize this. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was. And he could not, because of the press, or because he was little of stature, and he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste, come down, for today I must abide at thy house. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of this his word. This man, little character, our scene opens at, at Jericho. Uh, Jericho was the lowest city in, in the Palestine. And it's in the valley. And, and Jerusalem is up on the, the mountain, up on the hill. And if you notice, Jesus, when he came to the earth, he was... Um, given among man the lowest name that could be given. His come, he was Beelzebub. That was the worst name they could ever call him. That's a devil, a fortune teller, evil spirit. They called his work 
an evil spirit, the unprepared uh, uh, church to meet him. Uh, they give him a horrible name, Beelzebub. And he came the most humblest birth that could ever be born, of a peasant mother, not even a place to uh, lay down to, uh, to give birth to this uh, baby. And his swaddling cloth, we're told, was off of the yoke of an ox that they wrapped him in in the manger in a stinking stable over uh, the wastage in the stable. And the stable is not even a correct stable, a little cave in the side of the hill. And he dealt with the lowest, most uh, poorest of people. And he was rejected by the highest of societies. He was rejected by his own, the church, that ought to have known him. But they didn't. They wasn't trained in the word to know him. And we find again that he went to the lowest city that was in Palestine. Jericho, I forget how many feet below sea level it is. Way low. He stooped himself so low until the smallest man of the city had to climb up in a tree to look down on him. Well, that's what the world thought of him. They give him the most crucial, hardest death that any man could die. Uh, he died as a malefactor. The most disgraceful that he could die. Stripped his clothes off of him. Of course, you see on the statues and so forth, they got a cloth around him. But he despised the shame. They stripped his clothes completely from him. Nailed him to a cross in shame. The lowest, hardest death that could be given, they give it to him. Now, that's what the world thought of him, but God thought of him. Till he gave him a name above every name that's named in heavens or on earth. Exalt him so high till he's thrown so high he has to look down to see heaven. That's what God thought of him. I'm sure that's our thoughts this morning, too. It's above every name, above every name it could be named. Even the whole family in heaven and earth is named Jesus. And by this name, ever, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess to it. Zacchaeus was just a, a businessman in the city of Jericho. And he was, no doubt, a, a fine man in his way. He... He was, let's say, I believe, being a fine man as he was, he must have belonged to some church, one of the denominations of that day. Let's say he was a Pharisee. And uh, he really, uh, he didn't go with the views of his wife. Let's say his wife's name was Rebecca. And he didn't go with her views because she had believed on Jesus. She believed him to be just what he was, the Messiah, because she had seen him do the sign of the Messiah. Her being a Hebrew, Hebrews watch after signs and prophets, because that was to be their messenger. That's the reason that they should have never failed to have known him, because he was coming, the Son of Man. Read the rest of this dealing here with Zacchaeus. For the Son of Man come to seek and save that which was lost. He's the son of Abraham when they accused him of going with sinners. So we see they should have understood that, but they didn't. They had their theology of, of living good and being fine people and so forth, but they didn't understand what really their Messiah was to be. You know, that could be again. That could so easily happen. That we would misunderstand it in some way. Now, there's only one way to be sure. That's find out what he was. And then the Scripture says He's the same. Find out how He will manifest Himself at the end time. It's written. See, He never does anything unless He reveals it first. He said so in the Scripture. He does nothing except He reveals to His servants the prophets. And He has revealed it, and this is His prophet. This is a book of prophecy. It's a complete revelation of Jesus Christ all the way through. Nothing to be added to or taken from it. And... We are to search it and see what day we're living in because we might be caught in the same trap. So we find that during this time and this uh, Zacchaeus, our little character this morning, this businessman of, of Jericho, 
We, uh, he might have belonged to the Kiwanis if there was such a thing or something to symbolize it. He, he might have been a member of some of the great orders there that was in Jericho. No doubt an outstanding man for his, his time. And he belonged to the church. But the bad thing we find is he had taken sides with the modern opinion, the popular opinion of Jesus. And Jesus is the Word. And the Word manifested as Jesus. See? And so he had taken the, the side of the popular opinion that he was not a prophet. That he was only a, a, a... I don't want to say this word as we call it today, four-flusher. Just a, a something that was putting on. But you see, Satan can impersonate that so perfectly until it's hard to know which is right and wrong. Jesus said it would be that way in the last days. So much impersonation. As Jambres and Jambres withstood Moses. Remember, them two men could do anything that Moses and Aaron could do. But the only thing that Moses knew and vindicated, well, he never came, Jambres and Jambres, to deliver the slaves. Moses came in the name of the Lord to deliver the slaves. See? Because it was thus written, they told Abraham, your seed will sojourn for 400 years, but I'll bring them out. So Moses had, thus saith the Lord, but they could impersonate any kind of a gift that they could produce. Them knowing it, they never paid any attention to their impersonators. They stayed right straight with the word. God finally declared. And you know, he said, and it would be in the last days, as Jambres and Jambres withstood Moses, so will these men of reprobate mind concerning truth. That's right. See? Just simply impersonations. So it does get a bit confusing to the people. Sometimes you scold them, but yet it, it's not to, but you don't like them. It's because you do like them. What if you had uh, your little boy was sitting out here in the middle of the street and you'd walk out and say, Junior, dear, I don't think you should sit out here. He'd say, go tend to your business. You'd give him a little, um, what did you call it? <laughs> like my daddy gave me, posterior protoplasm of stimulation. <laughs> that's what he would need. And so that's... Um, uh, what sometimes you have to give the church. Not because that you don't like Junior, but because that you do like Junior. Yes, right. See? Love is corrective. That's, Jesus wasn't ev evil with them. He loved them. And He must correct them. So uh, we find uh, this little fella and Rebecca, uh, his wife, and she believed that he was a prophet. The prophet. They hadn't had a prophet for hundreds and hundreds of years. They knew the next on the scene, next real prophet would be him. They knew that was come because it was prophesied. So the prophets had ceased. And then he come on the scene and she'd seen that Messiah sign and she knew that was that word. See, she had searched it out. So our drama starts from here. Must have been an awful night on the little fella. It was a restless night. And he couldn't sleep. He, is, he was rolling around over his pillow all night long. Many of us know what those kind of nights are. You see, Rebecca knew. She was connected with the disciples and so forth. She knew Jesus was to enter the city the next morning. And she was so interested in her and her husband that she wanted him to be brought face to face with Jesus. And a man ever stands face to face with him, it does something to you. He's not like other men. He's different. And she wanted him to be sure that she's seen him, seen his work, and knew that he was that Messiah. Although the priest in them had said, there's nothing to it. It's just a bogus. It's, it's a hoax. But she believed it. So she was praying. Now, Rebecca, if you want to get your businessman, Zacchaeus, really... Before Jesus, you just start praying. He'll get restless. So the time had drawn close to the hand. So the next morning, Jesus was to pass that way. So all night he twisted into the bed and he was miserable. And she laying there praying. And no doubt in the night when he'd wake up, 
She'd say, thank you, Lord. I know you're working on him. Now, when you go to see your Zacchaeus, can't rest. You say, thank you, Lord. You're working on him right now. When you see him get so crabby, he don't want you to go to church anymore. See, stay away from that bunch. Don't go down there anymore. There's nothing to it. Just be patient. God's working, you see. That's why he doesn't sin. You just get so restless, you can't stand it. So we find the next morning real early, our little character slips out of bed and goes over and grooms himself in his very best clothes, you know, his finest robe he had and grooms his beard and combs his hair. Rebecca looks out from under the cover and she sees him. She knows right then something's up. So he slips to the window, looks over and see if she's to look uh, awake. No, she wasn't awake according to what he thought. He raises up the curtain, looks out, it's breaking day. So he <clears throat> gets himself all ready. You see, when you go to praying for somebody, something goes to taking place. That's where we fail, friends. Not praying. If prayer is the keynote. Ask and you shall receive. You have not because you ask not. You ask not because you believe not. Ask the abundance that your joys may be full. Ask and believe that you receive what you ask for, then hold on to it. Don't leave it. If it's a promise in the Bible and it's been revealed to you that God's going to give it to you, hold to it. That's just the way she had. She had it was revealed to her that her Zacchaeus was going to be saved, so she just held right on to it. So as he starts out the door, she said, Zacchaeus, why are you doing up so early this morning? Oh, he said, dear, I thought I would... <coughs> uh, you know, you can make all kinds of excuses, Zacchaeus. Uh, I thought I would walk out and get a breath of, a breath of fresh air. You know, kind of... Would you brush up or something like that? <laughs> she knows something. So he, here he walks out, looking back at the house. You know, as he walks out the drive, looking back, her peeping through the lattice, you know, looking to see what it was doing. She knew right there. And she got out and said, Thank you, Lord. I believe it's all over now. We got him moving. <laughs> so if you got your Zacchaeus down to the meeting this morning, he's moving. <laughs> he may be sitting here. So uh, he's moving. We got him moving that far anyhow. So he started out looking back to see if anybody's watching him, you know. He said, now, you know what I'm going to do? Let's change our thoughts to his now. My wife's been all mixed up in this so-called prophet of Galilee when my, my priest and pastor tells me there's no such a thing as that in these days. All these miracles and things are just some kind of a hoax. There's nothing to it. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going right down and give him a piece of my mind. Oh, and that will make me outstanding man in the city to see when I can call him down to his face. I'll do that. So out he goes and said, now he'll enter on the south side, or, or from the north side, coming down from Jerusalem. He, from Dan, Bathsheba going down. I said, I'll, 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 he's coming down from Jerusalem, so I'll, I'll go down there at the north gate. I'll catch him when he comes in, and I'll stand right there, and I'll get a good look at him, and I'll give him a piece of my mind. Oh, how many Zacchaeus is there is out there. Talk about Jesus at the meeting. It's a bunch of holy rollers. There's nothing to it. If I ever catch that man, what I'll do? See? So he walks down to the gate. But the strange thing was, you know, he's going to give him a place right in the gate. Tell him he was a businessman. He belonged to the, the Quanacy. He belonged to the associations and, and all the, the sororities of the city. He, he, was a, he was one of the officials there. And he's outstanding and respected. He was a decent citizen. And, and uh, really, he wanted to tell him he didn't need to come to that town. They had plenty of pe preachers and plenty of churches. They didn't need his ideas around there. So he struts down the street, his little chest stuck out, you know. And, oh, my, what? Why, well, the rabbi might make him a deacon if they do something like that. So he goes down to the gate. But the strange thing, well, you know, somehow it's odd. But everywhere that... that Jesus appears, there's usually somebody there to hear him. And he, before he got there, he, he heard a noise. And they were singing all kinds of songs and, and glory to God in the highest and all these fine hymns they were singing and some screaming and shouting. Isn't it strange where Jesus is? He's always a lot of noise. <laughs> That's it. You know, he entered the temple and one day at, in Jerusalem, rather, and when he did, they broke down palms and screamed, and there stood those there, those great uh, professors of societies and things and priests, and said, make them hold their peace. He said, if they hold their peace, the rocks will cry out immediately. Something's going to cry out when he's around. That's right. 
You know, when Aaron went into the Shekinah, before the Shekinah, he had to be anointed and he had to, his garments had to have a pomegranate and a bell. And that's the only way that they knew that Aaron was still alive when they heard this noise. And when I think that that's the only way that God knows whether we're alive or not, when you hear a little noise, you take anything that's the dead, it, it, something's happened to it. So they had to tell whether he was alive or not by the noise it was made. So Zacchaeus heard all this noise down there. And so when he got there, the gates was jammed up and up on the walls and everything. And he was just a little bitty fella after all. So he thought, how am I going to see him? There'll be some of them holy rollers around him. But I, I just can't see him. So, you know, he said, I know one thing. I, I can't see him here because I'm too small. But I know he's going down to uh, my competitors for, for his lunch. So uh, I don't see if he was a man of any intelligence, he would come to my place of business, my restaurant. But he's going down to Lebinsky's. Or I hope he's not a Lebinsky here. So then anyhow, he's going down to his restaurant. And really, I serve the best food. And, and why would a man even, and Rebecca being a member of his church, then he go to a place like that? Well, he said, I know one thing. I'll go down here to where... Hallelujah Avenue crosses Glory Street. He'll pass that way. That's true. <laughs> right there. Down at the city street where Hallelujah Avenue and Glory Street crosses. You can always find him right along there. So he left the crowd and run down there. And he thought, now, groomed himself all up and said, now when he comes around the corner, I'll tell him. I'll give him a piece of my mind. He's to pass this way. So I'll, I'll, I'll when he comes by... Then he got to thinking, you know what? That crowd will follow him. They always do. <laughs> Where the carcasses, the eagles will be gathered. Not the chickens. The earthbound bird, the heavenly eagle, will gather with the carcass. <laughs> A chicken's his cousin, you know. He's down here where rats and everything else can eat him. But the eagle puts her nest way up there in the tree. Nobody can get to that. The parasites don't bother them. They fly too high. <laughs> Now, the predators and rodents and things that nuggle bother them. He's an eagle. They like eagle food. <laughs> this is it. <laughs> you know, Jehovah's an eagle himself, and he calls us eaglets. His prophets are eagles, seers. An eagle goes so high, there's no other bird can follow him. While well, the hawk try to follow him, he disintegrate. <laughs> That's right. That's what Samaria did. So many tried to impersonate. You'll soon find out. You'll let it rise a little higher. All the feathers will fly out. <laughs> right, they'll be grounded. <clears throat> Remember, he has to be a special built bird. And a man can follow this word, has to be special built. <laughs> built of God, not a seminary. We find when he higher he goes, if his feathers won't stay in, what good will it do him? And another thing, when he gets up there, what if he gets up there and he's blind, he can't see nothing. See, he's got to have eyes too. See? To know what he's doing when he's up there. So is God's eagles. <laughs> Higher you go, further off you can see and come back and predict what's fixing to happen. You understand? Amen. I think that colored brother back there could understand that pretty well this morning. See? Now, notice. Then we find that he said, If I stand here, that same group of noise, he'll never hear my voice. They're screaming and carrying on so... Uh, my rebuke to him and never mean anything. <laughs> That's good. So then, said, uh, but, uh, you know what I'll do? I'll tell you what I'll do. There's a sycamore tree standing here. And I'll get up in that sycamore tree. And when he comes by, I'll see him. And then I'll step right out there on one of the limbs. And I'll tell him what I've got to tell him. And he'll know that I'm Zacchaeus, the member of this fine denomination down here. I'll tell him where I belong and what my priest thinks about him. Well, that might be all right. He looks around and he thought, now the next thing, the first limb's about, about ten feet high. And he's only about four foot high. So how is he going to get the next six feet? So he wonders how he can get up in there. There's no other way for him to get to it. And he has to get up in this tree. So he looks all around and there's nothing but... You know, the, the garbage exposal hadn't been by yet this morning, and the garbage cans were sitting in the corner. He thought, if I could only get that garbage can over here, 
then I, that make me high enough to get up there and get a hold of that first limb. But I'm determined to see him. I'm going to see him. You know, there's something about it. When a man wants to see Jesus, he goes through some of the most radical things. <laughs> but see, God was dealing with, what was it? Rebecca's prayers being answered. See? Well, he goes over there and the collector hadn't been by yet this morning and the can was pretty heavy. <laughs> so he couldn't lift it. He's too small. So he tries and he couldn't do it. There's only one way he could do it. That's get a hold of it with his arms. Pick it up. But he's got on his best robe. <laughs> but there's something about it. <laughs> when you want to see Jesus real bad, you'll do anything. Right. And you, you'll just do anything if you want to see him real bad. So he gets out there and you see, Satan's going to try to keep you from doing it too. Everything he's going to put, he's going to put a flaw in the way every time to keep you from seeing him. He'll blind your eyes with anything he can. But if you're determined, God will make a way for you. He's passing this way this morning too. Don't let Satan put something in your way. Your time and this and I've got to do this. Just sit still a minute. So he gets down, stoops down, and the eyes roll on. He sure is spoiling himself now. He gets a hold of this garbage pail. Just about time he gets a hold of it and starts packing it, <laughs> here come his competitors around the corner. <laughs> Thought, wait, it's here, Zacchaeus. You said you'd never get in a bunch of holy rollers, but you're here. <laughs> <laughs> well, here he, he sits. He's standing here now with this garbage pail, his, his face red, while the competitor said, well, look. There's Zacchaeus, the restaurant man down here. He's changed his job. He's got a new position. Well, you know, he's uh, he's uh, works for the city, at the garbage disposal. Well, there's something about it. Oh, if you're determined to see Jesus, you'll do anything. Amen. He just held to it and his face reddened. His face swelled out and here he goes. Right over and sets it down. He looks around and let him get around the corner. And he gets up on the can and shinnies up the tree. Oh, excuse me, I oughtn't have said that. Shinny, you know, that's, that's a... How many know about shinny up the tree? Well, that's all right. That's all. In other words, he climbs up the tree. He gets up there, and there he is sitting there. You talk about a mess. Garbage. <laughs> he is a polluted sight. And sometimes God just lets you get like that. Yeah. I heard somebody today, you know their new way? I hope it never gets in our Pentecostal rims, though I see it leaking in. Come in, I shake hands. I, I take Jesus as my personal Savior. I like to see him get down there at the altar and die. Amen. Beat and squall and slobber. And <laughs> you know, when you, we used to have some horses, and when we fed them clover, that real pretty sweet clover, honey in it, it made them slobber. When you get close enough to Canaan, you'll slobber a little too, you know, so uh, eating that honey out of Canaan. So we find that here he is up in the tree now, wiping the garbage off of his new... He didn't think he'd do that. Just let somebody get praying for you. You'll do strange things. When he wiped it off like that, splinters all his knees, and all over his hands, sitting there picking them up. So now if I ain't a mess, you're I set said, you know, Rebecca told me that fellow was a prophet. Now, uh, I'm, I'm going to wait. I'm going to hide. So he sat down where two limbs come together. It makes a nice place for a seat. And after you've got that far, and you've got this far this morning, <laughs> Zacchaeus, you're sitting too where two ways meets, <laughs> yours and God's. When you dispose yourself enough to come out here this morning, well... Rebecca's prayers is about to be answered, but you're sitting where two ways meets out, yours and God's. And he sat there and he thought, she said he was a prophet. All these things he could think the thoughts of the people's hearts and reveal it to them and tell them what was wrong with them and all this thing about Nathaniel come and told him he was under a tree out there. You know, I ain't going to take no chances. I'm going to cover myself up up here in the tree. So I'm in a tree too. And so I don't believe he's a prophet, oh. I just don't believe it. Because my priest tells me there's no such thing as prophets. We haven't had it for hundreds of years. So, I, of course, you realize I'm giving a drama here to make a point. So he gets all the limbs and pulls them in around him, all around, disguised himself real good. So now when he comes up Hallelujah Avenue, from Hallelujah's turns to glory. 
So right here on the corner, when he comes up that way, when he turns the corner, I'm going to leave me one big leaf here so I can look out and see him. I'll raise it up. He'll never see me. No, up here. And then when he comes by and I get a good look at him, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pull these branches back and after he uh, comes by here and I'm going to give him a piece of my mind. I'm going to tell him about it. So he sat there a little while. After a while, he heard a noise coming. Usually Jesus comes with those noises. Yeah. So uh, here he comes around the corner. So he, what's the first thing he finds? A bunch of people gathering around the streets. He said, I'm glad I'm up here in this tree so I won't get mixed up with him again. So here he is up here in the tree sitting there all camouflaged all over so nobody would recognize him. His competitors won't know he's up in the tree now. So he's just got this one leaf. He'll raise up and look out and put it back down again. The rest of him is all covered over. So he raised up the leaf and the people are gathering on the corners. And, you know, here come the Mr. Jones out with uh, that sick child. When he heard the, the, the priest and the doctor right in his own restaurant discussing it the other day, that that child was dying, had a fever that the doctor tried to break and there was nothing would break it. And that child must never move from that house. But here, that, his own customer has become such a fanatic till they brought that child out in that cool March wind. And here they have it wrapped up in a blanket, a little girl of about 10 years old. What a fanatic. When he enters my restaurant again, that child will be dead, of course. I'll tell him. I'll give him a piece of my mind. After a while, the noise gets more and more. And all of them run out into the street. First thing, come around the corner of Hallelujah Avenue to Glory Corner. As you come around the street, we find a great, big, burly, bald-headed fisherman by the name of Simon. Said, would you please step aside, folks? Here was uh, 11 more behind him. Said, if you will, please uh, step aside. Our master was in a great service last evening, and, and virtue went from him. Great visions taking place, and he's tired this morning, and he's... He's, he's going to breakfast. Would you please just step aside kindly? And here goes the Jones family out with this baby. And the big fishermen and many of them said, Step back, would you please? Well, we've got a baby here that's just simply it's going to die. The doctors has given it up. Uh, uh, would you please let us just uh, as much as lay the baby in here? I'm sorry. They all want to do that. So I, I just can't do it. Uh, you'll have to stand out of side there. He's coming just right now. Uh, would you please step out? So I can see then uh, the little watchman from the tower he was in, in the tree. Uh, watched, and he's seen Mr. Jones and Mr. Jones get down on their knees in that crowd and said, Lord God, pass me not, O gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. While on others are calling, do not pass me by. And as he come by, he stopped and said, Mr. Jones, would you bring your baby here? It's kind of convincing. Yeah. Amen. He's the same today. Yeah. It doesn't take a prayer card. It doesn't take a group. It takes faith. Like Amen. blind Barnabas had at the other end of the gate when he went out. 200 yards from him, marked the place. How could he have heard his voice? But, oh, Jesus, son of David, that stopped him. Touched his garment and he turned around to bring him here. And, and they brought the little baby over there. He laid his hands upon the little baby. That's all he did. In a few moments, the father took it back and there went the baby down the street running. The fever had left it. It kind of softened him up a little bit. He said, wonder if he could be a prophet. It made him kind of believe it. You know, there's such things as that that convinces us. For he is the word. Not, I was, I am. And as he comes around the tree, he thought, well, he's holding this little leaf up looking down. As he got around the tree, he thought, could he be a prophet? It might be. See, you have to have faith. Could he be? And as he passed around the tree with his head down, walking in his mild manner, it's something other than you ever seen. Uh, you, you, you're changed. You can't be the same no more. I heard about him. You've heard about him. But when I saw him, his word, I, I, I never could be the same no more. There's something about him that's different from other man. There's something about him different from uh, 
bishops and cardinals and popes and so forth. He, there's something about him that's different. Little Zacchaeus had been touched. Rebecca's prayers had been answered. As he passed under the tree, he said, Well, I, I might apologize to Rebecca when I get back. He's on his road over to Vinsky's. That's all right. If he eats at another restaurant, it's all right with me now. See, he had done seen him. So when he got right under the tree, he stopped, looked up, said, Zacchaeus, come down. I'm going home with you for dinner today. He knew he was up there. He knew who he was. Brother, sister, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's to pass this way this morning. He's passed this way through the city. Been here this week. If this, you know what? If the president came, President Johnson came to Topeka, the flags would be up, the streets would be decorated, and he'd have a great welcome. But Jesus can come. There's hardly anybody who wants to come to see him. You'd have to have a police escort to get the president into the city. But we have plenty of seating room. See the difference? They don't care to see him. I hope Zach is this year this morning. And when he's passing this way, that's him talking to you. He came down out of the tree. Of course, the critics wanted to say, this man's a sinner. He said, Lord, if I've tuck anything through false acquisition, I'll restore it back a hundredfold. I'll give it back. And if I've defrauded any man, I'm ready to make it right. Uh, I'm ready. <coughs> Let's bow our heads. Zacchaeus, are you ready this morning? Why don't you come down and out of the tree? Why don't you come on? He's passing this way now. Passing through your heart, talking to you. Would there be, while you have your head bowed, praying? Is there anyone here would say, Brother Branham, really, I've been a little skeptic all along. Remember, he was a religious man himself. I've been just a little bit skeptic, but now I believe. Help my unbelief, God. Not to Brother Branham, because no one looking but just myself and God. So I'm going to raise up my hand and say, Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. Make me a true believer, Lord. Come go home with me today. And abide at my house. Today I must abide at your house. Will you raise your hand and say, Remember me, God. Lord bless you. Bless you. You. Remember me, God. Go home with me this morning. I know you're here. I know you know my heart. You're speaking to me now. You know the things that I've done is wrong. You know, I, even I belong to a full gospel church, but yet I have been negligent. I haven't done that what's right. I've neglected prayer meeting. I've put everything else. I have did things really that our, our belief don't stand for. I, I'm, I'm a woman and I know I've uh, dressed wrong. and I've cut my hair off. I've wore makeup. Now I'm supposed to be a full gospel woman, sister. Uh, have mercy on me, Lord. I want you to go home with me today. I, I, I'll be a, a living example of Christ from now on. Would you just... Feel that presence of God that you'd raise your hand and say, pray for me. God bless you. God bless you. You. God bless you, sisters. That's Heavenly Father, some of the Zacchaeus and Zacchaeus has raised up the leaf and has looked out. They have recognized that Jesus has found where they live and where they're at has revealed to them they're wrong. Many, many hands in here has went up. May you go home with them today, Father. Go to their house. Live in their hearts. May they never forget this morning. Yet in its uh, the ridiculous things that I... In the, to try to accumulate a, uh, a feeling uh, of a sense of humor among mixed crowd. Now, in this moment, when the point has come out that it's, it's only to, to get the people to realize uh, what's standing with us this morning here, the Word manifested in our city among us, Hallelujah. the Lord Jesus Himself, 
the Word made flesh, operating Himself through human flesh. O oh God, may our beloved friends see this and be brought closer to you. Go home with him, I ask again, Father, with every Zacchaeus and every woman, every Rebecca. May she know her prayers is answered. We commit them to thee now. And may they, without any hesitation, accept you into their heart, as this little Hebrew did that morning, though they've been wrong. Said, ought not he also being a son of Abraham? So you're ready to go home with us, Father. We pray that you'll never leave us. Go with us from the breakfast. As we sat here this morning and looked across the table at one another, happy, sense of humor, shaking each other's hands and in love with each other like only Christians can be. And I think I, I, I'm, I may never be here again. I, I may never meet this group again like this and at another breakfast. But I'm sure, Father, if they'll just let you go home with them today and abide with them, I'll meet them at a supper <laughs> when the battle's all won and the great table is spread across the canopies of the sky. And we sit and look across, and I looked this morning at ministers sitting here, gray-headed, that was preaching when I was a boy. I think they only cut the stumps out, blasted up the roads, and made it smooth running for these gifts that they prophesied that would come. God bless them. Bless them all. Bless these fine women who sacrifice for their husbands to preach and the sacrifices that all Christians really make. Be with them, Father. We sat there that night, look across the table to one another, and may we never see each other again from this morning until that time. But no doubt that tears, too, will streak down our cheeks for joy when I reach across the table and shake their hands. Then we'll see him come out. We'll be so glad we come down out of the tree. Maybe a tree of a creed. A denominational creed tree. Or something. Just come out of our selfishness. Come out of our stupid ways. Or our inconsiderate of Him. Come out of our blindness into the light. We'll be happy about it then when we see him walk out in all of his kingly robes. Walk down along the table and take his precious hand and brush all the tears away from our eyes. Say, don't cry. It's all over. Enter into the joys of the Lord that's been prepared for you since the foundation of the world. Until then, Father, abide with us. Go home with us and stay with us until that hour we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I love him. I love him because he first loved. When I went up the tree, he still loved me. And per look what a tree he went up now for me. A cross, a despised tree on Calvary's tree. Look what a tree he went up to bring you down out of your tree. I now you can't love him without loving one another. Uh -huh. I'll reach right across the table and say, God bless you, pilgrim. Just to cross to somebody. Because he first Don't you love him because he went to that tree for you? Amen. To bring you out of your tree. Won't you let him go home with you this morning? How many will take him? Raise your hand. God bless you.
businessman. I want to speak to you just a moment before leaving. Now, if you're not a Christian, if you haven't been a, uh, associating with you Christians, you people, if you accepted Christ when you raised up your hand, go to one of the pastors here. Uh, tell them what you've done. They'll receive you. Somebody, some pastor, write a letter to this for this boy here, this colored brother. That was Grace last night. That young man sitting there watching it, and he believed that. Yeah. See that how that boy, how that spirit turned around. Billy was telling me about it. My wife and I forgot home. Turned around when he's over in this corner, went around here and found that one yeah. to bring him home. Sovereignty. You take him with you. Go join up with some group somewhere that you can fellowship with. Preaches the full word of God. Stay with that word regardless. See? That's right. Businessman, did you ever whatever happened to Zacchaeus? He became a member of the full gospel businessman of Jericho. <laughs> That's right. That chapter down there, he belonged to it. <laughs> it sounds rational, but it's true, I guess. I'm sure Jesus wouldn't establish anything else but a full gospel chapter. And Zacchaeus become, wait, so now Zacchaeus, you do the same thing. Until we see you tonight, God bless you. I'll turn the service back here to the pastor.